Christ will hold me fast when the tempter would prevail he will hold me fast I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path for my love is often cold he must hold me fast he will hold me fast he will hold me fast for my savior loves me so he will hold me fast oh he saves are his delight will hold me fast precious in his holy sight he will hold me fast he'll not let my soul be lost his promises shall last bought by him at such a cost has been satisfied he will hold me fast over Isle Church. Greetings in the name of the one we love, who is and who was and who is to come, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Almighty. Welcome to members or guests or visitors this Sunday morning. The sun is shining. We praise the Lord for the glory of a new day. I'd like to call you to worship from Romans chapter 12 and 13. Hear these words from God. Therefore, I beseech you, brothers and sisters, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. Do not be conformed any longer to the desires of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may know what God's will is his good and pleasing and perfect will for your life. And chapter 13 says this, Therefore, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make, make no provision for your flesh to gratify its, its corrupt desires. So we have come this morning to put on Jesus Christ by faith, to confess our sin to the one whom we have sinned against most of all, and to receive his wonderful mercy and worship him in spirit and truth. So would you bow with me as we pray and begin our worship time this morning. Lord Jesus Christ, oh, stir our hearts to confess to you even now where we have gone astray in thought, 
with our tongue and with our deeds. We confess to you, Jesus, that we haven't offered our whole body to you as a living sacrifice, that we've walked away from the altar again and again. But we come now this morning to begin this new week knowing that those who confess to you their sin will receive your faithful and just forgiveness of our sin because of what Jesus Christ did. Lord, we're so grateful that we are pardoned, that we are redeemed, that we can be here and worship you in the freedom and liberty of the Holy Spirit. May everyone within the sound of this prayer right now open themselves up to the ministry of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. O oh, Spirit, come and do immeasurably more than all we can ask or even imagine. It's in your name we pray and rise together and greet one another in your name. Amen. And do so at this time.
love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will see the goodness of God. I love your voice. Have led me through the fire, darkest night. You were close like no other. Known you as a father, known you as a friend. And I have lived the goodness of God. Oh my.
choir for sharing your heart and the great truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ that he so loved this world that he came to save people and to see you singing about your Savior's love and your love for your Savior blesses our hearts doesn't it congregation it's just so precious let's pray together our Lord and our God as we worship you on this Sunday morning we come so thankful that you found us hiding in the garden of our own making, thinking that our own Eden, our own little paradise was all that we needed. Little did we know that we were spiritually naked before you, that we had no gifts no talents, no good works to commend ourselves savingly to you. And so you came to us in the garden of our own making and you, you flushed us out and you found us and you led us to confess our sin. And then you clothed us, not with animal skins, but with the righteousness of Jesus Christ who purchased an eternal righteousness for us by his death on the cross. And when you said, Jesus, it is finished, our perfect wardrobe for all eternity was stitched and in place. And now anybody who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ slips into that eternal wardrobe, that righteousness. And we pray that we would never lean on our own righteousness, church attendance, the waters of baptism, prayer, religious duties or rituals or incense or stained glass windows or organs or pipes or drums, that we wouldn't lean on the righteousness of our parents and great-grandparents, that we wouldn't lean on our righteousness above all, but we would look to you and see that your perfect 33 years of life on earth has been offered on the cross and all who believe in you have eternal life and will not be condemned on Judgment Day. We thank you, Jesus, for being the world's Savior. People from every tribe and language and nation and tongue are worshiping you this morning in heaven and on earth, here in a sanctuary made by human hands, but also in a sanctuary made by the hands of Almighty God Himself. How we praise you that you receive our songs of praise every bit as much as you receive the songs of praise from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, and Rebecca, and Mary, and Elizabeth, and Zechariah, and all the saints who preceded us. What a wonderful thought. And in that reality, heaven meets earth, earth meets heaven through the powerful working of the Holy Spirit. We bow before you over this great and glorious truth. And we thank you that we are as forgiven as the saints in glory. And as they are forgiven, so are we, only by the blood of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Amen? Amen. 
Well, they're perfect and we're not. We're equally forgiven, we're equally saved, we're equally justified, equally reconciled, equally adopted, equally chosen. Though they are in heaven, we are heaven bound. Though they see you face to face, we see you by faith. We thank you, Jesus, for these glorious evangelical gospel truths that we declare to ourselves, to the world, and to our loved ones. Oh God, how we lift up Ukraine right now. Our hearts ache and break, sigh and cry over the aggression of one nation to take over another nation. Be with those citizens who are grieving within Ukraine and citizens within Russia who are protesting and people around the world who are praying for an end to this, oh God. We hear your words, Jesus. There will be wars and rumors of wars to the end. And so we know ultimately what's going on. This is all a sign, a trumpet, telling us that the end will soon come. How soon, no one knows. But wars and earthquakes and tornadoes and tsunamis and evil and wickedness portend or look forward to the truth that you are coming to judge the living and the dead. That's what the Bible teaches. And so be with them. Be with Earl Kleinhexel as he goes in for a CT tomorrow. Fill Rich and Barb Hoving with comfort over the passing of their loved one and their travel to the service. Be with Marie Blaukamp as she continues to heal. We're looking for a new youth director. Please guide the team through our prayers. Be with our young people away this weekend for a winter gathering. And as they worship this morning in their place, Lord, we bless you for what they're learning, the fun they're having together, and the growth of their faith in Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, hear us now. Hear us, Jesus, as we Come and pray and thank you so much for your sacrifice. Thank you, Jesus. And we say together the prayer that that we need to offer to you today. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Let's rise together and tell the Lord to have his own way with us and our world.
Amen. Uh, before you sit down, I know, I know the gig. Uh, grab your Bible. We'll stand this morning as we hear the reading of, of Scripture. We're right in the middle of learning from the end of the first chapter of the Gospel of John, so I ask you to, to open your Bible there. And then keep your Bible open as we, we study this again together. Beginning with verse 35 of the Gospel of John, chapter 1. The word of the Lord says, The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard this, heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following, and he said, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying. And they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, So you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, to him Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated and we'll pray. <clears throat> Lord, the angels this morning have a front row seat to every worship service on earth. The Bible tells us that the angels are fascinated by the storyline of salvation. And they long to look more deeply into the storyline of salvation. And of course, the good angels can't be saved. And so, that you would stoop down in mercy to the human race that has rebelled against you, like the other angels who did, who cannot be saved, astounds the good angels. And so, we are here this morning, and we want to we want a sirloin steak for our spiritual food. We want the best drink you can give us right now. We come with an open Bible. But more importantly, or equally, we come with an open heart. We want to know what you say. And as we look at more of what it means to be a disciple of the Lamb, we pray that you would speak. For your servants are listening as Samuel of old. In your name we pray, amen. Did any of us who believe in Jesus Christ realize what we were getting into when we first started to follow Jesus Christ? I don't think so. I don't think any person, young or old, grasps what it means to take their first baby steps in following Jesus Christ. We are exploring what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And we are spending four Sundays on this subject. That's a significant portion of time in a passage like this, but we want to do it because Christians are either forgetting 
or not being taught in this generation discipleship. What it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. If you'll look at your text this morning, you'll notice in verse 30, 43, these precious words. Jesus found Philip and said to him, follow me. Follow me. This is going to be our, our focus this morning. Jesus is beginning his ministry. He's 30 years old. And he's recruiting his first class of disciples who will eventually become his apostles. In John's gospel, there is a focus on John the apostle, Andrew, Peter, Philip, and Nathaniel. And we're looking at these young men as they're being summoned to follow Jesus. They're being introduced to Jesus, but they're not yet leaving their job. They're not yet leaving family. Peter's not yet leaving his wife or his role as a fisherman with the others. That's going to come. You need to know that when Jesus walked by and said, follow me, and they dropped their fishing nets and followed him, they had had previous encounters with Jesus. And this is one such encounter with Jesus right now. And what you see here, before they fully leave everything to follow Jesus, are, are glimpses of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And what we extract from this passage will play out through the rest of the Gospel of John and plays out in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so that, what we're doing is we're, we're teasing out of this text the great trajectories of a disciple that we find throughout the rest of the Bible. In, ch in chapter 1, 35 through 51, the impression is made upon our heart that a believer is a disciple and a disciple is a believer. I'm going to say this every Sunday because you can't say I'm a believer and not be a disciple. You can't say I'm a disciple without being a believer. They go hand in hand, glove in glove. You can't say that Jesus is my Savior and not say he's my Lord and follow him. You can't say that Jesus is my Lord and follow him without him being your Savior. They go hand in hand. You remember in Matthew 28 before he ascended in heaven, into heaven, he said, go therefore and make what? The word he used was disciples, not, not make believers, but make disciples of all nations. And some disciples start out on their journey and they come to faith in Christ a little bit later on the journey. And you see the disciples in the stories of the Gospels coming to this great awareness of who Jesus is. This morning is your time, as we're in the third of four messages, if you haven't already, to pledge to the Lord, I will be your disciple for the rest of my life. Now that's a, that's a big, big decision. And we're going to look at what that means today. We've looked at two of four marks or traits of a disciple of Jesus. We've looked at the pointer. A disciple of Jesus Christ is a pointer who's pointing others to the Lord. We've looked at the truth that disciples of Jesus Christ are learners, lifetime learners. You stop learning, you stop following. You keep learning, you keep following. It's as simple as that. This morning, I'm going to bundle up Marks 3 and 4. And the two marks we're going to look at this morning, and I'm going to bundle them together, are these. Disciples of Jesus Christ are confessors. They confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord. And if you confess me before others, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you do not confess me before others, I will not confess your name before my Father in heaven. Disciples are confessors. They're confessing Jesus Christ. And then, of course, disciples are followers. They're following Jesus Christ. Follow me, Jesus said to Philip in verse 43. What I'd like to do right now from this passage is not present rules for following Jesus Christ. Rather, let's focus on what we will experience 
as a follower of Jesus Christ. I think every young man or young woman who's considering Christianity, what it means to profess their faith, needs to have a full or biblical understanding of what they will experience as a follower of Jesus Christ. As you'll hear a little bit later in this message, we haven't done a good job of preparing our young people to follow Jesus Christ. And so, let me begin, and I'm going to share four or five experiences that are part of the discipleship journey. Confessors and followers of Jesus Christ is our focus. Step by step, confessors and followers of Jesus Christ, first of all, will step further and further into the beautiful kingdom. And as they step further and further into the beautiful kingdom, they want more, not less, of Jesus. They want more, not less, of the kingdom. They want more, not less, of peace. They want more, not less, of the kingdom of heaven. You'll notice verse 49 that great confession of Nathanael. Nathanael answered Jesus, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Notice king of Israel. Nathanael is partially right. He is the king of Israel, but he's also king of the whole what? The whole world. And they didn't know this yet. They're young. They're learning about Jesus. And so he, he confesses the common confession of the day that Jesus is the king of Israel. The Messiah would be the king of Israel. But Jesus is not only the king of Israel, he's the king of the whole world. He's the king of God's kingdom. Paul writes that when he appears, he, he will appear with his kingdom. The kingdom has arrived in the person of Jesus Christ. And... The kingdom is for the whole world. But here's what you have to know. Until Christ returns or we die, disciples are in the world but not of the world. What does that mean? A lot of things. But essentially what it means is that a Christian is in the kingdom of God. And she sees herself as a loyal citizen of the kingdom of God, which is growing like a mustard seed, and it's going to become the biggest of all your shrubs. And we realize that we're in this world right now that doesn't like the kingdom of God, that hasn't entered the kingdom of God. And so we live with a tension, a tension between the fact that the king has come, Jesus He's died, he's arose, he's back in heaven, and through the Spirit, he unites us to himself and to one another as brothers and sisters. And we confess with Nathaniel that you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. But the kingdom is not fully here yet, it's growing, and it's yet to come. And the longer you follow Jesus, the longer you, you stay close to the rabbi teacher, that the dust of his sandals is falling on your toes and on your ankles because you're so close to him, the longer you follow Jesus, the more beauty you will see in the kingdom of God. The sunrise and sunset is not simply a scientific discovery. The beauty of a child within the womb of a mother is not simply biology. You start to put the pieces together of life's puzzle, the universe and all that's around us, people and vegetation and nations and, and the world we live in, and you start saying, this, this must be of God, and God must have a kingdom, because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, and so are you. Red, brown, yellow, black, and white, I, I love all the skin colors of human beings. That's part of God's kingdom, and he's pulling people in from all walks of life and all cultures. And you see the beautiful kingdom. And what you start to see as you follow Jesus, you step further and further into the beautiful kingdom and you see what a beautiful king you have. You love his laws. You love his words. You love his decrees. You love his ordinances. 
You love his calling. You love his world. You love the king. And you see Jesus as the most beautiful king the world has ever known. And you begin to see him as the eternal king of the kingdom of God. You come to see more beauty in all that he has promised in Scripture. You see that your salvation is more beautiful 20 years in than it was 20 years back. You start seeing that the words of Jesus are more beautiful now than they were in your 20s or your 30s. He is the beautiful one. In fact, the Bible says that he is lovely. He's, he's fairer than 10,000. Oh, how great is his goodness. How great his beauty, Zechariah declares in chapter 9. You begin to see how beautiful your hope is when you're around people who are full of despair and hopelessness. And you go, oh my goodness, I have something different in my life. I'm ready. If something were to happen to me, I have a beautiful hope. You come to see that you have a beautiful purpose in life before you leave. We're struggling today, aren't we? As a culture, as a civilization with the very purpose of existence. But a Christian gets this as they step by step go further into the kingdom of God. Following. We have this glorious purpose to seek first the, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I, I seek God's kingdom as a scientist, as a mathematician, as a geologist. I seek God's kingdom as a, a police officer in law enforcement or a fire person. I seek God's kingdom as a senior citizen. I seek first the kingdom of God. That is my purpose, and that fulfills me with what Jesus calls in John 10.10, 10, the abundant life. The abundant life. I, I have a, a beautiful future. You have the most beautiful future you could ever imagine as you sit here this morning as a Christian. And you're saying, but Mike, I came in here this morning down, depressed, despairing. I know. But you have to know that he knows the plans he has for you, says the Lord. Plans to beautify you and prosper you. Plans for good and not for evil. If you're a disciple, believer, believer, disciple of Jesus Christ. And so just that first simple thought this morning about a confessor and follower of Jesus Christ is this. Step by step, as you confess and follow Jesus, you're stepping further and further into the beautiful kingdom of Jesus Christ. That's discipleship. That you'll experience that. If you're not experiencing that, that raises some questions that should in your mind this morning. Number two, step by step, Confessors and followers of Jesus Christ not only step further and further into the beautiful kingdom, they step into walls of resistance. You and I will step into all sorts of walls of resistance. High walls, small walls, wide walls, dense walls, dark walls, foggy walls, hard to see walls, thick walls, impenetrable walls. Look with me at verse 29 from a couple of weeks ago. Behold, says John, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of what? The world. The world we live in is going to erect Barrier after barrier before your discipleship. Look at verse 46 with me. Nathaniel said to Philip, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? After Philip told Nathaniel of Jesus the Christ of Nazareth. Nathaniel's doubting. It's early in the discipleship reality, of course, for him. But he's questioning. He's skeptical. He's doubting. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nazareth was kind of a hick community, and no one thought anything good can come out of Nazareth. That's where he's going with this. But that's where Jesus was raised. And what you see is that we live in this world, and there are going to be walls of resistance to your Christian faith. Nathaniel doubted. In fact, even after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who doubted? Who was it, congregation? Thomas. It took Thomas eight days after the resurrection to believe when Jesus appeared in the upper room on the eighth day that night. We're not getting down on Thomas. We've been there. In fact, there's another one. I think that's even more incredulous than Thomas's doubt. In Matthew 28, 17, as Jesus had a large gathering of followers together shortly before he was going to ascend, the text says, 
They all gathered around Jesus. He's right in front of them. And they worshiped him. And then Matthew includes this little tiny nugget. But some doubted. Three words, but some doubted. I have no doubt (laughs) today, as we're here together, some of you are doubting Jesus. I want you to know, you stand in a long line of Thomas-like people who doubt the reality of Jesus Christ, the reality of the Christian faith. This is for you. What you're running into is what we call a wall of resistance. And step by step, confessors and followers of Jesus Christ will step into walls of resistance. Why? Because the other kingdom is here and it dominates so forcefully. There's an alternative kingdom in this world. So you have the kingdom of God, but then according to Revelation 11:15 15 and all sorts of passages, you have the kingdom of this world which is the major wall of resistance to belief. And it's swallowing up people with its jaws from church after church around the country and world today. The alternative kingdom, the kingdom of Satan, resists the kingdom of Jesus Christ with all its might. And we need to tell people that following Jesus Christ is dangerous. When you profess faith in Jesus Christ, you're entering a dangerous, challenging life. In fact, 2 Corinthians 11.26 reminds us of how dangerous it can be at times. Paul says, I was on frequent journeys, and this is what happened. He discovered danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from his own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers and sisters. And all the dangers that Paul encountered as a disciple of Jesus Christ were because he was following Jesus Christ. And you have to know that if you are a faithful follower of Jesus Christ, you will run into these walls of resistance in this dangerous world. Let me give you some walls. You will step into the wall of Satan, the wall of the great adversary, the deceiver, the ruler of this world, the prince of the power of the air, We know that we are of God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one, John writes in his first epistle, chapter 5. But that is a wall of temptation that will come your way in, in a variety of forms. He disguises himself as an angel of light. You'll run into the wall of of evil and darkness. You'll run into the wall of, of religions. And all of a sudden, it'll start coming in your mind, Mom, Dad, don't all the religions of the world believe in God like we do? Don't all the religions of the world take us to heaven like we believe Christianity does? You're going to run into that wall at some point in your life, and you're going to have to deal with the reality that the world is filled with religions. And if you believe that all religions lead to heaven, you believe that thousands of religions will lead people to heaven. You'll run into the wall of persecution. Simple mockery to jail or imprisonment as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Remember, if this is how they treated the master, said Jesus, so they will treat my servants. What do you expect as a follower of Jesus Christ? They crucified him. The world cannot hate you, says Jesus, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. And when we start testifying like Jesus did, that its works are evil, they will crucify us as well. That's discipleship 101. The world cannot bear the truth that it is living in sin. The wall of being a minority. This is happening more and more in your country today. Like a python squeezing its prey, the world's morality and beliefs is slowly squeezing and twisting around the Christian world and life view. And when people find out all of a sudden they're in the minority, all kinds of things start to happen. Their convictions were not as strong as they thought they were, so they give in. 
or they try to justify what's going on. Another wall you will run into as a Christian disciple is government. You'll discover sooner than later that governments are not necessarily great fans of Christianity and the Bible. You'll run into the wall of media that can mislead, the wall of greed, the wall of entertainment, the wall of war, the wall of poverty, the wall, the wall of temptation. In other words, here it is. Step by step, confessors and followers of Jesus Christ will step further and further into the beautiful kingdom, and that's the attraction that keeps them going, but they'll also step into walls of resistance to their faith. And what you need to know about the walls of resistance you faith, face is this. Every wall is a test of your faith. Every wall you face as a parent is a test of your faith. Every wall you face as a couple in your marriage is a test of your faith. The Lord hasn't left. You're following him, remember. He's going to lead you into difficult challenges that will test your faith. And you'll see this as we go through John in the Gospels over the years, that the three-year time they were, he led them over and over again into storms and to religious leaders who were against them and into difficulties. And so that will happen, and it'll test your faith like nothing else will, suffering and so forth. Step by step, confessors and followers of Jesus Christ, number three, this is beautiful. They, they step into the strength, security, and satisfaction of Jesus Christ. You know, Stephen was the first Christian to be killed for his faith. Read Acts 7 and, and you'll be familiar and reacquaint yourself with that story. But Stephen was willing to die for his faith because he had stepped so far into the beautiful kingdom in such a short amount of time that he experienced in his discipleship with Jesus the strength, the security, and the satisfaction of Jesus Christ. As a disciple of Jesus, you're going to run into traps everywhere, everywhere, daily. Choices to make. And what I want you to understand at this moment is that Christ sees your journey. Every step you take to faithfully follow Jesus, no matter where he leads you, he sees it. He knows your steps. Look at verses 37 and 38. The two disciples, and this is presumably John the Apostle, and of course, Andrew. The two disciples heard John the Baptist say, verse 36, Behold the Lamb of God, and they followed Jesus. Now watch this in verse 38. Jesus turned and saw them following. I mean, that's worth a million dollars in the bank. He saw them following Every step of your life, he sees you following. He sees what you're experiencing. He knows the wall. He knows the temptation. He knows the heartache. He knows how you're responding like a grandparent did 50 years earlier because you have the same genetic reality. He wants to break you out of the, oh, that's just how my family is syndrome and we've always been. No, Christ has a freedom for you that you can't even dream of. And he sees Every step you take when you follow him, that's because he's leading you. If you're with your eyes on Jesus following Christ, confessing him, and I want to follow you, you're going to make bumbles, we're going to stumble, we're going to sin, we're going to be upset with all of that. But you know what he's saying? Follow me, follow me, follow me. Keep coming. He knew these disciples would doubt him. Oh, you of little what? Keep following me. You'll see more. He knew that they would argue about who's going to be greatest in his. Follow me. I get your humanity. That's who you are as Adam and Eve's offspring. I get all that. That's why I'm here. So keep pressing on. Don't give up. And when you step into the strength, security, and satisfaction of Jesus Christ, you'll never want to bail. 
Notice verse 43. The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. That's north from where John was baptizing. He found Philip. And here it is. He said to him what? Follow. Follow me. And so what we're saying here about the strength, security, and satisfaction of Jesus is to remember whom you are following. You're not following an idea. You're not following a concept. You're not following a church. You're not following some preacher. You're following me, says Jesus. This is pre-death, pre-resurrection. And they followed him because they believed he was the Messiah. Then he died, and it was lights out. It was depression. It was anxiety. Lord, we've left everything to follow you. Our lives are on the line. Our families don't quite understand it. We've left our jobs, our income. We've followed you. What's going on? Now they crucified him in front of our eyes. They didn't know yet it was for the sin of the world. And then on the third day, the earth seemed to pound. He is risen again. And he came to life and they saw him that first day. And hope revived. And what he says to you now is you're not following a pre-crucified risen me. You're following a post-risen ascended me at the Father's right hand. You're following me. And when you follow him that closely, I want to be so close to you, Jesus. Here's what happens. Number one, strength. Wasn't Paul shackled with chains around his ankles in a, in a dungeon prison when he wrote these words, I can do what? All things through Christ who strengthens me. That's the strength of Christ. You can do all things. You can't do all things, but you can do all things through Christ. If he leads you into it, he'll lead you through it. His strength. And then there's the security part. When you follow Christ, you will step into his strength. You will step into his security. What is that? That means I know Body and soul, life and death, I belong to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Here I am, Lord, I can do no other. You know what God says to some of you this morning? All of us, of course, but some of you more than others. Neither death nor life. Neither angels nor demons. Nor any powers nor the present, nor the future, nor anything else in all creation will be able to what? Separate us from God's love in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Do you need to hear that today? You follow Jesus, he'll give you security. Your alarm system's going to fail. Someone's going to break into your house. Someone's going to open your trunk. You can't secure your world. But in Christ... You have life's ultimate security, and you have life's ultimate satisfaction. The deeper you get into the kingdom of God and following Jesus, you just say, Jesus, there is absolutely nothing and no one in this world who satisfies my heart like you. Oh, what a gentle lover he is. What a tender lover he is. What an understanding and compassionate lover is Jesus. He's the lover of my soul. He's the lover of my life. He's the lover of my past, my present, my future. He loves me without condition because he's called me to follow him. He's paid the debt on the cross. This is the Jesus we follow. And as a, you will experience this as a disciple. Walls of resistance, of course. The beautiful kingdom expanding in your heart, amen. But you'll also experience strength, security, and satisfaction. Is it worth it to you? Briefly on this one, I'll touch this fourth one because I want to get to the fifth one and we'll be done. Step-by-step confessors and followers of Jesus Christ step into character formation. Character formation. How we need this today. Verse 49, Nathaniel's confession goes like this. Rabbi, you are the son of God and the king of Israel. He's the son of God, the king of Israel. And then up above, they confessed him and said, Rabbi, Rabbi, teacher. Listen, God designed the Christian family and the Christian church to form Christian persons. But you know what's happening today? The church is being outfoxed 
by YouTube, TikTok, social media, and pressure from everywhere. In other words, the catechesis, the catechetical instruction, the catechism of the day, the catechesis. We've always taught, we've always instructed, we've always let the catechism and the teaching of the church form us. That's not forming us. The new catechetical instruction of this generation is social media. And it's just inundating the little bit we're trying to do in the church and at home. But when Christ says, follow me, he's saying, follow me most of all. Let me shape you. Let me form you into whose likeness? His likeness. You see, we live in a time right now when many young people are being shaped into the likeness of this world. It's so overpowering. It's so overwhelming. And Jesus says, follow me and I will change you from one degree of glory to another into my image. This comes from me, the Lord, and my Holy Spirit will do it. Fifthly, and lastly, step by step, confessors and followers of Jesus Christ. Now hold on to this one. They step into the battle for the true Jesus. This is what a disciple does. A a disciple steps into the battle for the true Jesus. Verse 49 again. Nathaniel. By the way, this is the only place Nathaniel's mentioned John's gospel. In the other three gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, there's Bartholomew. So Nathaniel's mentioned in John. Bartholomew's mentioned in the other three gospels, but they never overlap. So that leads scholars to believe, and I would concur with them, that Nathaniel and Bartholomew are the same person. Side note. Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the king of Israel. Now, when Nathanael confesses this, he doesn't fully grasp all that he's saying, but he's confessing it by the Holy Spirit. And here's what's going on. This this confession by Nathanael has been the battleground of world history for 2,000 years. He set off in motion, as Peter and the other disciples did, a battle For the true Jesus over the last 2,000 years, listen, it goes like this. The identity of Jesus Christ is the greatest battle in the history of the world. The battle for the identity of Jesus Christ. Because whoever wins the identity battle of Jesus Christ wins. And that's been happening for 2,000 years. You see, the true Christ of the Bible is assaulted In 2 Corinthians 11.4, we read about another Jesus. Listen to this. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus, you Corinthians, then the one we proclaim, you put up with it readily enough. So Paul is preaching the true Jesus. And the Corinthians are having these false apostles telling them other things about a Jesus of some sort. And they start going that way. And Pastor Paul is just a little frustrated because I preach to you the true Jesus and someone proclaims another Jesus and you put up with it. Another Jesus. And we have the same thing in Galatians 1 6, where Paul writes, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. And so, very early in Christian history, there was another Jesus than the true Jesus, and there was another gospel than the true gospel. In fact, the very day of Jesus' resurrection, this started. The leaders paid off the guards to tell everybody that the disciples took Jesus' body and stole him away. And that has been told since that day. Day one after the resurrection of the Son of God, the liar of the world, already was at work. Day one. And it's happening even in our day. And you, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, will experience the battle for the true Jesus And here's where we are today. Did you know that 70% of Christians in America, 7 out of 10, according to a recent poll, believe that other religions lead to heaven? Then you don't need Jesus. Do you know that more and more Christians are saying that you do not need faith to get to heaven? And that Christianity is not the only way 
to get to heaven. What do you make of that? What do you make of that? 70% of Christians believe other religions lead to heaven. Here, here's what I think we should say. To the degree that that is true, it reveals a massive nationwide discipleship failure on the part of the Christian church. We are not catechizing our young children into discipleship. We are getting them to make a profession of faith. And once the profession of faith is made, they fall off. Confessing and following Jesus Christ, now here it is, protects you from false ideas, false pictures, false doctrines, false teachings, and false beliefs about Jesus Christ. The only way you can keep the true Christ in your sight, of course, is through the Word of God. You're following Jesus, and you're close to Him. And when the counterfeit appears, oh my, do you know it. When that counterfeit bill appears, you know it's a fake 20 spot or 50 spot because you've studied the real 20 and the real 50 to such a degree that when the counterfeit appears, boom, you got it. But you got to know what Jesus is like and who he is and who the Bible says he is and what he says about himself mostly. Jude 21 says this, keep yourselves in the love of God. And I've wondered for a lot of years, what does it mean to keep myself in the love of God? Doesn't God keep me in his love? Well, he does. But there's also a sense in which I need to keep myself in the love of God. And I think I finally have part of it. To keep yourself in the love of God is to keep confessing and following Jesus Christ, who is the love of God. So if you want to keep yourself in the love of God, keep Christ front and center. And you won't lose sight of him. Now remember this in closing. A believer is a disciple. And a disciple is a believer. in what God has joined together, let no one separate. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your, your teaching on discipleship. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can learn what we will experience. We will step further and further into your beautiful kingdom. We will obviously step into walls of resistance, but at the same time, we're stepping into your strength, security, and the satisfaction of following you. And we are stepping into spiritual formation to be made more like you, and we are always stepping into the battle for the true Jesus. Help us to fly your flag and no substitute in our heart today, and may that flag be planted on the mountain of our soul declaring to ourselves and to everyone, here King Jesus will reign. In your name we pray, amen. Let's rise and sing. I love to tell the story.
Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you, equip you, disciples of Jesus, with everything good for doing his will, working in you that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever and ever. Amen. Go in his wonderful peace.